On this question, we want to find the equation of the line passing through the points negative 5, 7, and 3, negative 6. We want to write the equation in point-slope form, slope-intercept form, and standard form. So let's list out what each of those formats are. So for point-slope form, that's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. For slope-intercept form, that's y equals mx plus b. And for standard form, that's ax plus by equals c. So we want to write our equation of the line in one of those formats, actually all of those formats. And we're given these two points that are on the line. So in order to find these equations, we're going to need to know the slope of the line. And we do have a formula for calculating the slope. If we're given two points on the line, we can calculate the slope by doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I'm going to assign one point to be x1, y1. And I'll assign the other point to be x2, y2. So one of them is x1, y1. The other one is x2, y2. And I'll substitute into the slope formula. So that's going to give me negative 6 minus 7 over 3 minus negative 5. And we'll simplify. This gives me negative 13 over 3 plus 5, that's negative 13 over 8. That's our slope of the line. And once we get the slope of the line, we're going to be able to use point-slope form, that's this one here, to write the equation of the line. In point-slope form, you need to have the slope, which we just figured out, and a point on the line. And that's why it has that name, point slope form. You need a point and a slope to be able to use this form. So I'm going to choose one of these points. It doesn't matter which one. So let's just use the first one here. In the formula, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So y1 is 7. The slope was negative 13 over 8, and then x1 is negative 5. So we have x minus negative 5. Uh, I would like to simplify this. That double negative should be simplified, so that's y minus 7 equals negative 13 over 8 times x plus 5. This is the equation in point-slope form. So we've done this part. Then we want to write the equation in slope-intercept form. So if we take a closer look at slope-intercept form, slope-intercept form has y by itself on one side, and it doesn't have any parentheses in it. So we're going to simplify this. I'm going to use a special technique called clearing fractions. To rewrite this, this allows me to avoid finding a common denominator. So we're going to take this denominator here, and we're going to multiply it on the left side of the equation, and then we're going to multiply it on the right side of the equation. We have to do the same thing on both sides to keep the equation balanced. Now on the right side, the 8s will cancel out, and this gets rid of the fraction, at least for now. And that helps me avoid having to get a common denominator later. Now we'll use the distributive property. I'm distributing the 8 to both of these terms, and I'm distributing negative 13 to both of these terms. So we get 8y minus 40.
Now that's 56, not 40 something. And then negative 13 times x, that's negative 13x. And then we need to do 13 times 5. And that's 65. So we have minus 65. So I just want to remind us what our goal is here. Our goal is to write y by itself on the left. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to add 56 to both sides. That gives me 8y equals negative 13. And we need to do negative 65 plus 56. That gives me a negative 9. And then we'll divide both sides by 8. And now I have my equation y equals negative 13 over 8x minus 9 over 8. That's our equation in slope-intercept form. So then finally, we want to write the equation in standard form. Standard form is ax plus by equals c. We want x and y on the same side. So I'm going to start with y equals negative 13 eighths x minus 9 eighths. And I want x and y on the same side, so I'm going to add 13 eighths x on both sides. And I have 13 eighths x plus y equals negative 9 eighths. And this is standard form, but my math lab has some special instructions here that they want the coefficients and your constants to be integers. So they want you to get rid of the fractions. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by 8 on the left-hand side and multiply by 8 on the right-hand side. This is going to clear the fractions just like it cleared the fractions earlier. And so when I distribute that 8 to the first term and then the second term, the 8s will cancel out for the first term, leaving you with 13x. When you distribute to the second term, the 8s don't cancel, so you have an 8 there. And then on this last part here, the 8s cancel, and you're left with negative 9. So here we have our equation in standard form. So for this question, we want to classify the given function as a polynomial function, a rational function, a root function, and then find its domain. We're going to write the domain in interval notation. The function that we're looking at is f of t equals 5t to the fourth minus 3t cubed plus 2t squared minus 6t minus 2. So the first thing we want to do is classify this function as either polynomial, rational, or root. It's not always easy to classify something as a polynomial function, so I typically look at the other two types first because they have some obvious features that make you choose to choose them as root or rational. So for root functions, you're looking for functions that have a variable inside of a radical. That's pretty obvious. And then for rational functions, you're looking for the fractions. You're looking for a variable in the denominator. So as I said, the polynomials are not as obvious. But you can see that the function that we're working with doesn't have a variable under a radical. It doesn't have a variable in the denominator. And if we look at the details right here, I've given some practical ways that you can figure out if something is a polynomial. So you're looking for no fractions, all the terms in the numerator, the variable should not be inside a radical or inside an absolute value, and very specifically the powers on the variables should be whole numbers, these nice numbers here. So if we look at our example, 
we've got t to the fourth power, and 4 is a whole number. t to the third power, 3 is a whole number. t to the second power, 2 is a whole number. t, and there's no power there, so we assume it to be a 1, also a whole number. So we, what we have here is a polynomial function. Now the great thing about polynomial functions and I've got that stated over here, is that polynomial functions have no restrictions, no special um, exceptions. Any number, any real number that we substitute into a polynomial function will give us a real number for the y part. So since it has no restrictions, that means any real number can be substituted in as a member of the domain. And the way that we write that is negative infinity to infinity. So if we're thinking about the number line, what we're saying is that every real number can be included in the domain with no restrictions. And that starts at negative infinity and ends at infinity. So this is how we say all real numbers um, are a part of the domain. So on this question, we want to classify the given function as a polynomial, a rational, or a root, and then find the domain. And we want to write the domain in interval notation. So starting off, we want to identify which type of function we have. So we've got these three types of functions that we're working with, and we want to try to recognize which type we have. The rational and the root are more obvious than the polynomial. When you have a rational function, you're going to see a variable in the denominator, so something like 1 over x. When you have a root function, you're going to have something inside of a radical. So as I just said, for the rational functions, we're looking for something like 1 over x, a variable in the denominator. For the root function, we're looking for some variable underneath a radical. And then polynomial functions don't have any of these messy features. So you can see in this example, we do have variables that are in the denominator. And so we're going to classify this as a rational function. So we've got up here, rational functions are in fraction form. We're looking for the variable to be in the denominator. Now, once we know that we have a rational function, we do have restrictions. So the reason why we have restrictions is because rational functions are in fraction form. And the denominator is not allowed to be 0 because division by 0 is undefined. So because we're not allowed to have a 0 in the denominator, rational functions have this restriction. So we need to figure out for our function what those restrictions are. So we're going to create an equation where we take the expression in the denominator and set it equal to 0. So q of x is what we have in our denominator over here. So we're going to take the expression in the denominator q of x set it equal to zero so that we can figure out what those restricted values are and what numbers need to be excluded from the domain. So we take this t cubed plus t squared minus 20t. This is the expression that we have in the denominator. And we're going to set it equal to zero and solve. So this is called a polynomial equation. And we're going to solve this by factoring. We have a common factor of t 
in every term. So we start by factoring out the greatest common factor. And that leaves me with t squared plus t minus 20 equals 0. And then looking inside these parentheses, we want to factor some more. And this is a quadratic. We can factor it into two binomials. The numbers that go in the front here need to multiply to be t squared. So that's going to be t and t. The numbers in the back, they need to multiply to be this last number here, which is negative 20. So I'm going to try 5 and 4 because 5 times 4 is 20. There are other choices. 2 times 10 is 20, and 1 times 20 is 20. But I'm choosing 5 times 4 so that I can get a 1 in the middle. So 5 and 4 are close to each other. I'm going to be able to get that 1. So we need a plus on the 5 and a minus on the 4. And if you're struggling with factoring, make sure you multiply that out and check. So if you multiply that out, you would get t squared minus 4t plus 5t minus 20. And when you add these two in the middle, that's going to give you that 1t that you're looking for. Okay, so once we have it completely factored, we're going to use the zero product property. And the zero product property says if you have a bunch of things multiplied equal to zero, that one of them must equal zero. So either t equals zero, or t plus 5 equals zero, or t minus 4 equals zero. And then you're going to solve. So we're going to subtract 5, and t equals negative 5. We're going to add 4, and t equals 4. So our restricted values are these values here, 0, negative 5, and 4. So I'm going to place these numbers on the number line so that I can figure out my domain in interval notation. So these numbers, these restricted numbers are negative 5, 0, and 4. We're going to mark them all with open circles because they need to be excluded from the domain. But all of the other numbers are going to be included in the domain. So then we need to represent each one of these intervals. So this interval starts at negative infinity and ends at negative 5. This interval starts at negative 5 and ends at 0. This interval starts at 0 and ends at 4. And this interval starts at 4 and ends at infinity. So we're going to be able to say that the domain of this rational function is negative infinity to negative 5, union with negative 5 to 0, union with 0 to 4, union with 4 to infinity. Notice I put parentheses on all of those numbers. They are not included in the domain. Parentheses means the number is not included. Thank you for checking out my videos. Have a great day.